In the beginning, there was Adam. Wait, what? In the last episode, we talked about the very first second of existence after the Big Bang, and it took us over 10 minutes to cover. Good grief, at this rate, to explain everything that's happened up to this point in time will take literally 8,000 billion years. I'm running out of time! In that one tiny second, though, the universe managed to make pretty much all the quarks it would ever need. Arthur, could you please explain quarks to us for those who weren't listening? Good. You can click, um, here to see the last video if you don't remember. This way you can learn and I don't have to repeat myself. I'm an academic, not a parrot. At least I got to use this costume again. In this second, the universe has also managed to grow to a few light years across. A light year, by the way, is the distance you would go in a year if you were travelling at the speed of light. Light is incredibly fast, so this is a big distance. In just one second going at the speed of light, you would travel roughly 300 million metres. This distance is equivalent to travelling around the world seven and a half times, but in one second. So as I was saying, the universe has grown to a few light years across. This means our universe was about 10,000 billion miles wide, which is roughly the distance from our sun to our nearest star here. Very far. No, very far. There's not a star called very far. But there is one called Pollux. No, Pollux. Its energy is also spreading out with it, so it's cooled down quite a bit too. But it's not done yet, and to be fair, it's still about a billion degrees, which is 173,000 times hotter than the surface of our sun. I'm coming for you, sun! As I explained last time, it's now too cold to cook quarks. By cooking, I mean bringing them in and out of existence from photons. In a few more seconds, it's going to become too cool to cook electrons as well. And whatever of these we've made in the first few seconds will basically be stuck with forever. At this stage, protons and neutrons, which are formed from the quarks we just made, start coming together too. When this happens, we get atomic nuclei, which is just a fancy name for the centre of an atom. Just to be clear, nuclei means you have more than one atom centre, and nucleus means you just have one. Like cactus and cacti. Wait, how did we get here? Just to note, even a proton all on its own is an atomic nucleus too. There doesn't have to be more than one particle there. Going from a nucleus to an atom then is pretty simple. I mean, can you t tell, the can you see the, can you clear, is it clear what the, electrons, yes. Well done, Arthur, you got it. To become proper atoms, nuclei need electrons. But although it's cool enough for the electrons to have frozen into existence, they're still far too high energy to get tied down by the nuclei, the non-committal bastards, so they roam free among the photons. Now, the universe was growing so quickly at this point, it obviously didn't take long to cool down enough for electrons to slow down enough to bind to nuclei. Actually, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson's astrophysics audiobook, of which these facts I've stolen... ...appropriated. Plagiarism is a serious crime. For the universe to cool down enough for this binding to happen only took about 380,000 years. Oh, wait, what? 300 th th years! But it's been two minutes and the universe has basically birthed itself out of nothing. Ew. Into a four-dimensional entity containing all the major particles and energy in existence and now it's gonna take a 380,000 year siesta! I- I don't know how to use these. So... 380,000 years later. The universe has grown so much that it's cooled down to 3,000 Kelvin. We'll explain Kelvin later. The fuck? At this temperature, which is about half as hot as the sun. Oh no, it's winning! Electrons have lost enough energy to be able to join up with the nuclei from earlier in a process called recombination, which allows us to finally start forming atoms and elements. Am I too late? In this 380,000 ish year gap before we made the first atoms, the universe was just a seething mess of charged particles, with electrons and protons and a few other things that we haven't mentioned floating about. This means light, or photon particles, would have had a lot of trouble passing through the universe at this point. You see, photons are actually scattered about when electrons are present in a process called Thompson scattering. Come up with a better name, Thompson! So during this stage of existence, photons were basically just being thrown all over the place, or scattered, by all the free electrons floating around the universe. As a result, light couldn't travel in a straight line for long without becoming scattered. A little bit like looking into a kaleidoscope. I'm everywhere and nowhere! Now this is important because the way we see is by light travelling from an object into our eyes. But because light was being constantly scrambled, or scattered, all over the place, you just wouldn't have been able to see anything. We describe the universe at this stage as being opaque, as light couldn't pass through it, it was all just getting bashed all over the place, it would have been like trying to see through 
soup. It's like I'm really there. When recombination finally happened though, many of the free electrons in the universe were effectively captured and locked up as atoms. This means these electrons were no longer floating about free, so could no longer scatter photons. Finally, light could now travel freely through the universe unhindered. The universe had become transparent. I can see! It's a miracle! I'm some kind of soup Jesus! After atoms were formed from recombination, they also released photons in a process called photon decoupling. We'll come back to why later on. So when atoms in the universe first formed, billions and billions of photons were given off and they could freely pass through the universe. And so because recombination gave off this photon energy when it happened, an imprint was effectively left in the sky, flashes of energy throughout space, like a picture telling you where all the matter was exactly at that moment of decoupling. And it looked just like this. So if the Big Bang actually happened the way I'm describing, surely we can see or detect this imprint in the sky from when all these atoms were made and all these photons were given off. Yeah, you just gotta turn on your TV. Behold, the creation of the universe. Mm, finally. Some good fucking food. Wait, what? What I'm saying here is if you put on a channel with no reception, a decent portion of the static you see is your TV interpreting and displaying microwaves coming into the planet from outer space. Cook my carbonara space! Do it! This is known as cosmic background radiation and is largely made up of the photon energy that was given off when nuclei and electrons came together to make atoms during the Big Bang over 13 billion years ago. And to think people think finding dinosaur bones is cool. Hey Matt, isn't Jurassic Park? On. The reason the static is just a random mess on your TV is because the planet is being bombarded with this microwave energy and other signals from all round and your TV isn't really designed to make any sense of it. But the data is there. What's that? You want me to kill them all? Khajiit has been telling you this for years. The imprint actually looks more like this, and we'll make sense of this data in the next episode. It's also really fun to note that the physicists who first discovered this cosmic background radiation actually won the 1978 Nobel Prize in Physics with a $300,000 cash prize, leaving them forever immortal and achieving one of the greatest academic discoveries known to man, but originally thought the radiation was a weird hum caused by pigeons pooing on their satellite. Which is like accidentally photographing Jesus Christ and mistaking it for a smudge on the lens. Smudge on the lens? And here's the telescope. Good grief, no wonder it was full of poo. It's basically just a shed with a hole in it. Anyway, back to the atoms being made. If we take just one proton and one electron and bring them together, we make the most basic atom, a hydrogen atom. Since that's all it's made up of, it's an incredibly light element, which is why we put it in blimps. I was gonna make a joke here, but better not. To be more specific, 92% of the atoms made during recombination were hydrogen. This was the most common atom formed in this stage simply because it's the smallest and simplest to make. The remaining 8% were just the next simplest atoms to make. Helium, which is made up of two protons, two electrons, and two neutrons. Finally, they get involved, right? So if you think about it, all the matter around you right now basically started off as hydrogen or helium because they were the easiest elements for the universe to make. But how did we get heavier elements like carbon or oxygen or iron or osmium? Osmium. Osmium. I'm not William Osman. Going kind of slow, man. Let's speed it up. Stars are made up of hydrogen and helium. When stars burn, they just smack elements together to make bigger, heavier elements. Kind of like... Like smacking a small child's head. I couldn't think of another thing to say. Stars change form over time a lot as well, which really lends to the creation of even heavier elements. It's easy. It goes stellar nebula, protostar, average star, red giant, planetary nebula, Stop. white dwarf, black dwarf, or protostar, You're massive star, again. red supergiant, supernova. Stop. So how did we get the heavier elements? Well, stars. Stars. Actually, we need to talk a little bit about the elements before we get to stars. Oh God, he's right, I am slow. But we finally get to reach the point in my career where my eight years of studying chemistry comes into some bloody use. <laughs> so let's get kitted up and learn about hydrogen, helium, and the elements. I took off this lab coat so that I could do that jump cut. The periodic table quite rightly scares most people. I mean, look at it. The fuck is molybdenum? Molybdenum is a silvery white metal that's highly ductile and resistant to corrosion. All the periodic table really does is list the elements in order of how many protons they have. And we read the periodic table just like a book. Huh. We start at the top left and go to the right. Then when we're at the end of this line, we go to the start of the next line down and read to the right again. And so on. That's it. The first element is hydrogen and it has 
one proton. The next is helium, which has two protons. Then we go to lithium, which has three. Then beryllium, which has, say it with me. Yes. Yes. You can do it, Arthur. Nine. God damn it! So basically, as we go along, the elements get heavier and heavier as they start being made of more and more stuff. Nitrogen, which is what the air is mostly made of, is down here. So it's much heavier than hydrogen, which is up here. And this is why hydrogen gas floats. Because hydrogen atoms are so light, hydrogen gas is a lot less dense than air. So the hydrogen balloon floats. Where the hell am I? If you want to get really technical, you don't actually find hydrogen atoms on Earth floating around like this. You see the very first layer of electrons around an atom, or its first shell of electrons, ideally has two electrons present, or the atom is incredibly volatile and reactive. Just think of shell one electrons like gorillas. You ideally need two together to be happy. I mean, I'd rather have two cats, but someone won't let me. I will drink the blood of my feline competition. So even in the tiniest amount of hydrogen gas, there are are billions and billions of hydrogen atoms. The way these atoms make sure they have two electrons is by sharing their one electron with an electron from a different hydrogen atom, like this. This means this hydrogen can see two electrons, and this hydrogen can see two electrons, and they're fucking pleased about it. This also means they are now covalently bonded together. You see, the definition of a covalent bond is non-metal atoms sharing electrons. But if I were to introduce a small amount of energy into some hydrogen gas, it would split some of these happy dihydrogens into single hydrogens that only have one electron each. If this happens, the single hydrogens are going to go absolutely crazy and react with anything they can nearby just to get the electrons they need. Like this. <laughs> because there's oxygen in this room, that's mostly what the single hydrogens have reacted with. This means we get a molecule that's made up of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, also known as water. Water is an incredible compound for numerous reasons. Incredible! Making it like this is a hugely exothermic process. Fuck! <laughs> Exothermic just means the energy is given off or exits during a reaction. This is just all that energy exiting very quickly as water is made. Helium atoms too are super light because they're only the second heaviest element on the periodic table. So helium gas also floats in air because it too is less dense than air. These scissors don't work. I'm so glad I came all this way for this important experiment. When are we going to get that down? Just to say, I'm actually at the University of York today, and I couldn't have done this without them. It's just a shame I live four hours away from the university. Uh... Okay, that's all we got time for, but in the next episode, we're going to talk about how all these huge clouds of hydrogen and helium turned into stars and galaxies. See you there. But first, a word from our sponsors, Audible. Audible. I'm honestly really happy to say that this month's video was sponsored by Audible, particularly because pretty much this whole series has been inspired by Neil deGrasse Tyson's amazing audiobook, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. It's also an audiobook you can get for free with a membership with Audible. That way you can listen along as this series continues. <gasps> and he's a lot more to the point than I am. He is not happy about this. So start listening with a 30-day Audible trial and your first audiobook and two Audible originals are free. Visit audible.com slash up is not jump or just text up is not jump to 500 500 to get this offer, which is also linked in the description. Seriously, Neil deGrasse Tyson reads the audiobook and his voice is like cream in your ears. Not this time. <laughs> so the membership includes one free audiobook a month, exclusive sales, and 30% off all regularly priced audiobooks. As well as this, you own these audiobooks. This isn't a rental or streaming service. Once you have the audiobooks, they're yours, even if you cancel your subscription. So just one more time, that's two fingers, visit audible.com slash up is not jump or text up is not jump to 500 500 to get this offer, which again is also linked in the description. Thank you all so much for watching and supporting my series. I plan to make this science on a very long-term project, and companies like Audible allow me to keep increasing the production quality, which I know you're all fond of. <laughs> Bye everyone, and thank you so much. What do you think, Sid? I forgot to get the voice actor to do a line for this bit, so... Bye everyone! <laughs>